Welcome to a Neon Jazz interview with a jazz musician busy on the double bass for many, many years and the author of the flavor-rich website jazzonfilm.com, Joe Spivey. Coming straight from the heart of Bath in the United Kingdom, Joe has worked hard to compile a comprehensive listing of jazz in the history of film, documentary, shorts, and TV programs. Over the course of our interview, he discusses the most important artists and songs profiled over the history of TV and cinema, along with a host of very interesting jazz revelations. Please dig this interview, my friends. I want to, first of all, thank you for taking a little time out. To oh, no, that's with... okay. That's okay. It's fine. No, no, well, thank you for asking me to talk about uh, jazz on film, you know. My first question for you is, what is your background in jazz and loving and being involved with jazz? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, I mean I mean I'm sort of seventy now. So, uh, but uh, I always loved jazz. You know, I started with off with some Louis Armstrong '78 records when my parents owned. And quite honestly, I've never liked any other kind of music. I've never liked popular music, the Beatles and all that Liverpool sound in this country passed me by. I still always loved jazz. Also, my parents were passionate cinema goers, and as a child, they took us to the cinema all the time, and uh, I always loved it. And when I saw some of these films in the 50s when I was a teenager, and it featured some of the more modern artists, you know, at the time, like Jerry Mulligan and Chick or Hamilton, some of the Hollywood feature films. I mean, I loved it, you know, and I always had a passion. So I started to collect, try to collect the, collect the films on the VHS or even, you know, 16mm and, and the posters as well, which I was a big poster collector. And, uh, and basically, I decided about nearly 15 years ago, I decided to combine it all into one, into one website. I was going to publish a book, but I thought, well, that would soon be out of date. <laughs> so yeah. I thought if I had a website, that would be able to do it now. I could update it as new films came out. And now yeah. with YouTube, I can put clips onto it as well, which I was a bit concerned before because I thought I'd be sued and I'd, I'd be infringing copyright. But, but these days, I can let YouTube take the flack on that, you see? Yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. That's for sure. Um, so tell me how the website began and how much momentum it, it's created and where you're at today with it, kind of the birth, the growing up, and where we're at today with it. Uh, well, basically, it was basically, I, I never considered, say, I did think about the idea of selling things on it, like jazz videos and things, but I thought, no, this would be too much of a problem, there's lots of other people doing that, like Amazon. So basically, I saw it as a kind of educational research tool, and hoping people will come to it, they're trying to find out about different artists. But the thing is, I take responsibility for everything that's wrong with the site, like mistakes and typos, because I, I don't have anybody researching. I do I do the lot myself, and I've done the design myself, and I and I update it on a regular basis myself and search out the material, you know. So, uh, so, so uh, that's the main thing. I sort of like tend to sort of tend to do it a few times a week, you know, in between doing gigs and different things, you know, and. Uh, so it's really it's, it's it's like a passion, you know. It's, it's not there's no real business side to it. It's just a sort of a, it's it's just a mad passion of mine that I hope people are trying to find out about jazz in the cinema or on you know, or on film. They can they can look at it and they can find out find what they're looking for. When you say gigs, are do you are you a musician? Yeah, I, yeah, I play the double bass. Oh, cool, uh, man. Yeah, what, I play the you... double bass in some. Uh, yeah, it's mainly local. I live in the West Country now, but I used to live in London, and I, I used to play. It was mainly uh, what they call like uh, when I started. It was like the end of the what they call the the traditional jazz boom in this country, and this was like just before the Beatles sort of, uh, you know, came along, and they, they sort of. I think they finished off most jazz musicians from making a decent living once the sort of like, uh, you know, the pop boom started over here. But I mean, there's still, but I'm still doing quite a bit with various bands and things. But now I just do it, you know, what they call, uh, you know, maybe once a week or twice a week at the most, you know. It's yeah. very hard, like even in America, to go out and just make a living playing jazz. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You're totally right. I mean, the very best. I mean, we, you know, but I know, I know for, you know, I know because when I've been to the States, I mean, you, you can see some world class jazz musicians in small bars with half a dozen people in them, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, have you played with any 
any big shots, any luminaries? No, anybody? no, not really. No, well, only only in this country. I mean, yeah, I used to play with somebody, a bloke called Ken Collier, who was a bit of an old legendary uh, traditional player in this country, and he inspired, you know, he inspired a lot of guys in this country to, you know, he was one of the founders of New Orleans jazz in this country. But when I played with him, he was quite an old man, you know, he was he was at the end of his. Uh, career because he was on you know he was doing it in the early 50s you know but i didn't really start playing jazz till the till the um, say mid 60s you know basically yeah 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 so let's get back to the website why is it so important for us to have a preservation of jazz on film why is it so important for us to really look back on all these musicians that have been in film um well, I think, well, you know, unfortunately, some of the great musicians have never been on the film, and sometimes it's not the early musicians, sometimes it's like the, the late musicians, like Clifford Brown. There's only about a minute of two minutes of Clifford Brown on film. There's only about seven or eight minutes of Charlie Parker. There's somebody like Duke Ellington, and lots of, you know, lots of people. There's lots of stuff on film, right from the late 20s, you know, right through to, you know, the 70s, basically, you know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Uh, two things I do focus on is I've tried to build up. But one of the pages on my site is about what I call uh, uh, it's called black, black cinema. And basically, seeing the well, you must know. You know, you've been an American. You know, in, in in the states, segregation was it didn't really exist in this country. Yeah. You know, I mean, we didn't really have a sort of like a a, a black population until the fifties. You know. It was one two black people, but over there, but it was very segregated jazz, and basically there was a, you know, there was a kind of black, there was a what they call a black cinema going on, you know, it was a whole industry of uh, uh, black filmmakers making films for black audiences, yeah, you know, that, that was showed in sort of maybe cinemas where, you know, sometimes if it was mixed, basically the black audience would be maybe have to be in the balcony and the white people would be downstairs. And um, so, I mean, so I've got pages on that where people can find out about that because a lot of people, you know, never realised there was a sort of like a a black cinema where they was making all, not just, you know, musicals and jazz films, but, you know, things like a westerns, you know, uh, the comedies for children, all, all kinds of things, all with a completely, uh, you know, all with black casts, you know. Yeah, yeah. What would you consider some of the most important jazz artists captured on film? If you had to have kind of like a top tier list of this is what I would really like for you to see to get a well rounded view of how jazz yeah. has been depicted in film, what would you pick? This is a tricky one. I've got my favorites. I mean, uh, in say, let's say Hollywood films, I was in George. Sometimes the best films with jazz excerpts aren't always very good films sometimes, but the ones for the best jazz excerpts. I always thought the Susan Haywood film, I Want to Live, yeah. was great because it had a fantastic opening sequence with the Jerry Mulligan octet, I think it was its septet. Anyway, he's got Art Farmer, Shelley Mann, you know, uh, uh, Frank Rossellino, Bud Shank, I believe, if I remember, Pete Jolly, but all the all the very best of the West Coast jazz musicians at the time. And so I, was, so I, was, I always used to enjoy that as a youngster when I first saw it. Uh, so there's been films like that. I also enjoy some of the old soundies. Do you know much about what they call the soundies? No, not really. Well, the soundies, I mean, funny enough, it's more an American thing than over during the war. So, uh, uh, a company invented this thing called uh, uh, basically it was like a visual jukebox. Yeah. And they used to and they used to put uh, they used to have uh, like a 16 millimeter projector inside this visual jukebox. And uh, you used to project, and you used to put your, I think it was five cents in America, put your five cents in, and you could press a button, and it would show, it would show, a, you know, a, a, a three-minute film, you know, like a musical film. Sometimes yeah. they were country and western, but at the time, there was lots of jazz artists were recorded, people like Count Basie, Duke Cunton, Louis Armstrong, you know, uh, uh, and people like Hoagie Carmichael singing and things like that. And basically, these things almost like went into obscurity. But I think people did rescue them in the age of the video, and all of a sudden they got released. But I always found the soundies very, very interesting. <laughs> sort of like, yeah. I think they're great because they they capture what was happening at the you know, you know, and uh, 
you know, at the, at the time, you know, and it, the, you know, it's the remarkable bits of film that have been preserved, you know, because a lot of film was completely, you know, uh, lost, of course, you know, because you know, because of the, the way the celluloid breaks down, you know, sort of, but, uh, but you know, I mean, there's been talk about those, you know, there might have even been some film of um, uh, the King Oliver Band with Louis Armstrong, but it's never ever come to light. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So. But those guys, I mean, the great, I mean, the Charlie Park on the film playing with uh, the Coleman Hawkins. Uh, I always thought that was a, a great, great bit of film. I enjoy watching, you know. Well, that was a part of a documentary, and uh, as a famous film called uh, Jam and the Blues. I think that's one of the very best films. That's Lester Young, Lester Young and Harry Harry Edison. Yeah. Play, you know. But these days, there's so much because, I mean, people could just go to a concert with their iPhone and record some great jazz, you know, jazz on film now. Yeah, but In absolutely. those days, it was very difficult to do that, you know, it was expensive, and uh, and that's why people like Clifford Brown, there's hardly anything of people like Clifford Brown. Yeah. And, so, you know, some artists just don't, some artists just don't exist on film, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I'm always amazed at how prolific, Charlie Parker resonates throughout the world. It's not just yeah. jazz, but music, how little there yeah. is on film. And um, actually, the Mutual Musicians Foundation, which is the oldest union in the world for jazz musicians, is based here in Kansas City. And I just found out the other day that that clip of Coleman Hawkins and him can fetch thousands of dollars. Somebody owns all a lot of video of Charlie Parker. If you want any of it, it comes at a pretty penny. So... Um, yeah, yeah. I imagine. I think most of it is available to buy on DVD and things. You know, yeah. the park and stuff. Unless somebody has a lot more, you know, that well, I haven't seen. You know, but you know, I think it's only about. I'd be surprised if more than ten or twelve minutes of Charlie Parker on film. Yeah. I say, you know. I mean, it's, uh, hasn't Kansas City hasn't it, hasn't it got a Charlie Parker museum? We have. Is there, is there a jazz museum? I mean, a jazz museum. Yes, it's it's the American Jazz Museum. It's the it's, it's the Hall of Fame, so to speak, and it's yeah. dedicated to all the musicians. It's not specifically to Charlie, but Charlie's uh, grave site is up here in Kansas City. We have a big monument down at 18 and Vine to him, yeah. and uh, yeah, we have festivals that are in yeah. his honor. So Charlie never really leaves the Kansas City radar, yeah, so to speak. Let me also ask you, as such a big jazz fan, why is jazz so important? To me, well, I, I don't know. I think I think was it was it the American critic Whitney Bailey? And he said about it, it was a sound as a prize, and I was like it. I was like, you know what I like? I like the I like the, I like the swing. I like the jazz to swing, whatever happens, and I like the move in a harmony. I don't particularly like jazz, where, you know, where it, like, especially you get this with pop music, where the, the where the harmony is quite static. Yeah. Which you find with jazz, you know, the best jazz to me, you, you never know what to expect, you know, sort of, you know, you never know what the drummer's going to do. You never know what the, say, the saxophone's going to come up with. And every time you, li when you, this is when you listen to live jazz, of course, not necessarily a record, because then you become familiar with what they're doing, you know, on a record. But if it's live, you never know what's going to uh, happen. It's always on the edge to me. Yeah. With the best jazz musician, let's say, you know. And yeah. sometimes they can be, you know, sort of they can just play okay, and other sometimes they can be totally inspired, and that's what I, that's what I love about it. Uh, you know, I love yeah. the whole. I, I love the, I think it's to do with the, the idea that you, you're improvising, and you're, you're not really thinking about this is the way we do it, this is the arrangement. I think they just respond to each other as they're playing, you know, and that's the great joy for me for jazz, for jazz, you know. Yeah, yeah. What. What would you say are some of your favorite jazz albums of all time? Uh, oh yeah, they they they. Uh, oh, I'm very eclectic. I like. Uh, I mean, one of my favorites is a uh, is Milestones, not uh, uh, the Miles Davis, the Milestones, the one he made before Kind of Blue. I never yeah. liked Kind of Blue too much, but I always yeah. loved Milestones, I and mean, it had the same lineup almost with John Coltrane and Cannibal Adley. I always liked that, but. I always, I always loved the uh, Louis Armstrong's Hot Five, and I love Jelly Roll Morton's uh, uh, Red Hot Peppers. But also, one of my favourite artists was uh, uh, was uh, Clifford Brown, and uh, I always loved uh, all those Max Roach, Clifford Brown quintet records. You know, numbers like yeah. Joy, 
Joy Spring, I think that's one of my what they call desert island discs. They've only had so many, but I still like a lot. I like a lot of the modern. I don't like it. I don't like music that's too free. You know, I'm not yeah. crazy over. Uh, I don't really like Cecil Taylor too much, but I love. I like the early Ornette Coleman quartets with Charlie yeah. Hayden because he was such a great bass player and Don Sherry. But I go more for the kind of, uh, you know, like the lot the post box stuff, you know, like Horace Silver Quintet. And also like some of these these people who who who, who sort of play more swing music, you know. There's a great American, but I think he lives over here now called Scott Hamilton. Do you know him? Yes, absolutely. Well, I think he, he he's often here in this country. Whether he re- whether he lives in in Europe, I do not know, but he's often over in this country. But I love his playing. You know, he plays that kind of uh, Lester Young inspired tenor. You know, sort of. And I think he's great. I think he's a great player, great swinger. You know, and. Uh, to me, that's what jazz is all about. Yeah. Be swinging. <laughs> yeah. 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 Absolutely. Let me ask you this. If you could go back in time and see a jazz show in America, yeah. who, what, what would you want to, what would you want to see? You go back in any, any, any period oh. of time and witness the show. What oh, would you want to, see? Oh. Yeah, that's an easy one for me. I would love to have been at the Massey Hall when uh, uh, Charlie Parker was playing with Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Mingus, Max Roach, and Bud Powell. Yeah. And those all look massive. And apparently I read somewhere that apparently that concert, it was only about a third fall because there was a big major boxing match apparently in America and everybody was watching the boxing on television. Wow. <laughs> and, and that's why they said it, 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 they timed the concert very badly with this very famous, I forget who the boxers were, but it was a very famous boxing match. Wow. <laughs> and they didn't sell, and they did this concert did not sell out at all, you know. Yeah, that's, that's one of life's ironies. It to be to me. I mean, I've got a record of it, but it's well, to me. I thought it's the idea of seeing those five musicians together. I mean, when I was a youngster, Ronnie Scott in this country had the Ronnie Scott Jazz Club. He brought a lot of the people across. I mean, I saw Sonny Stitt. I saw Dexter Gordon. I saw Charlie Mingus. You know, most I saw. You know, apart from people like Charlie Parker, who, 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 who probably. Uh, you know, well, he was probably dead in the mid '50s, wasn't he, Parker? And uh, I, uh, I saw most of the major jazz musicians who came to this country as a youngster, like Louis. Ar- I saw Louis Armstrong when I was about 15 years old. At my wow! Local, at my local cinema, you know. And yeah. I, yeah. I remember going. A friend took me to see them because he knew I liked Louis Armstrong. I was only about 15 at the time. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So, so I mean, you know, uh, so I've, 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 I love jazz. I, I think all aspects of jazz. You know, most jazz I like right from the early twenties right up to the present day. But I don't yeah, like it yeah. if it's too. I don't like if it's too strange. In fact, some jazz I, it doesn't even strike me as being jazz. But there you go. That's a personal thing with me. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, I understand, and that's the way yeah. it works. It's uh, yeah. the business of yeah. improv. Yeah, ah. yeah. A film I can always recommend. It's it, it's a it's a film when Robert Altman made a film called Kansas City. Have you seen the film Kansas City? Yes, yes. He made a documentary at the same time called I think it's called uh, 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 Kansas City Jazz Kansas City Thirty Nine Jazz Revisited. I think it's called. Yeah. And it's an hour long documentary of all the musicians who are actually in the, on on the feature film soundtrack, and they're just blowing it blowing in this sort of uh, a recreation of this. Uh, Kansas City Jazz Club, and it's got all these great people like Joshua Redman, Christian McBride, uh, 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 people like that, you know, uh, uh, Nicholas Payton, and people like that, you know. But, ama- it, but it, uh, that is an amazing, amazing documentary. In fact, I think there's a little bit on it on my website. But if you go to uh, if you go to documentaries, I think it's called Kansas City Revisited. I think I'll put a little clip of it on there, you know. But that's really yeah. worth checking out the whole film. <laughs> Yeah, I'll have to take a look at that. I didn't realize yeah. you made an accompaniment documentary to that film. That's great. I'd well, I think it. what it was, yeah, because I remember I saw it in London during the London Film Festival years ago, and, and Robert Altman was in town and he introduced it, and he said, he said, he said, he, you know, he didn't, he didn't know a great deal about jazz, but he says he's assured that all these people were the greatest, some of the greatest jazz musicians playing in America at the time, you know, and they were, yeah. like I said, there was a bit like Christian McBride. Nicholas Payne and uh, uh, James, I um, can't remember his name now anyway. I know Joshua Redmond's on it, and uh, oh, David Murray as well. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's wonderful. Okay, sir, thank you for your time. Okay, well, thank you for ringing me. Thank you.
Take care. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in America, the United Kingdom, and spots all over the globe, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to the very passionate Joe Spivey for his jazz-rich catalog of knowledge via the web and his music. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store, or you can always visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com for all things Neon Jazz. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.